Hello to everyone online. And um, we're all here today to welcome, sorry, I did it again, um, to welcome Michael. Thank you so much for joining. Um, so I got a little bit of the backstory of why Michael was here. You were here 10 years ago. Ish. And met with various people. Didn't get it. The usual suspect. And now you're back from work, which is fantastic. Um, so for those of you who, um, who need an introduction to Michael, I'm going to read his bio. Um, Michael Grove is Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor, you'll need to do the translation of what that means, um, for Education Policy and Academic Standards at the University of Birmingham, um, Professor of Mathematics and Mathematics Education, and a National Teaching Fellow. Um, the nation being the UK, is that correct? Yes. Um, as Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor, he provides strategic leadership in higher ed education policy, in ensuring excellent education standards across the university's diverse student community and broad curriculum portfolio. His role focuses upon the university's response to and engagement with higher education policy and regulation, student access and participation, award, awarding gaps, graduate outcomes, measures of teaching excellence and learning gain and quality assurance and maintenance of academic standards. He has responsibility for leading the university's strategic response to developments in generative AI associated with learning and teaching, and for the university's strategy and work in assessment and feedback. So we are so excited to have Michael here today. As you know, we've all been engaged in really fulsome discussions about the path forward of this institution in all of these areas. Um, I'm confident that in hearing about what Michael has been working on, we can have a sharing of ideas, input, and for momentum. And we're so excited to hear about the amazing work that you're doing, leading, leading uh, the UK and leading your, your university in, uh, in generative AI going forward in education. So thank you, thank Michael. You. Join me in welcoming Michael. Thank you. I think there's always a nervousness with a build-up like that, that now I have to deliver uh, for the next uh, 50, 55 minutes. So, so thank you, and I will, I will do my best. Um, well, it, it's, it's lovely to, 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 to be here. Um, I came on campus on, on Saturday night um, and just realised how much it has changed. Uh, but then, sadly, I also realised it's not only the campus uh, that has changed. It gets worse. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so that, that was how Michael used to look and likes to still think that he does. As I was saying to, to Brett earlier, I started growing this beard after the last time that we met. Um, <laughs> but note the date, September the 19th, 2014, uh, where I came in and spoke a bit about the, the, the mathematics problem. And, and colleagues, I think, in this room were, were, were there. So uh, clearly I did something right. Uh, and I, I think I will say a big thank you to Simon for the invitation to, um, uh, to, come, to come back, because I think... The things that you're doing here are really fantastic and that ability to learn and share um, is, is, is truly wonderful. Um, and so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit. Um, I'm going to focus a bit more on my experience as kind of an academic member of staff of Generative AI, setting it in the context of mathematics. And I think I'm, I know some of the work that you're doing really kind of pushing uh, things on. I'll give some hints at what we've been doing as, a, as an institution. Uh, and I really think within the UK, we are very much ahead of the head of the curve. I think when you look around the world, you see other institutions that are really pushing things on to the next level. And, and here, I think, is a, is a, is a great example. Um, but looking at those photos gave me an idea that you probably, OK, you might guess what I'm going to do. Um, but I thought, what I'll, get, I'll do is I'll get my mom to describe what I look like and then see what generative AI comes up <laughs> with, right? Does anyone want to see this? Yeah. Right? So remember, this is what my mother thinks of me as created by generative AI. Right? <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. Um, they nailed the stance. They, they nailed the stance, but the thing that I'm more interested in is the compass, yeah. right? Um, Believe it or not, I had to think carefully about what I'm going to wear each time I, I use these slides. Um, but that then sort of led me to a few things. And my kind of view with some of these tools, um, there's a school of thought where people say, actually, no, we should ban it. We should go back to closed book exams. 
Um, but the reality is these tools are now out there and within, within the learning experience. Uh, so I'm really quite keen to get people to, to engage with them. Um, and I think you only start to understand some of the opportunities, some of the limitations by actually engaging. Uh, and my caveat here is a lot of what I do is based around the commercially available tools. So I run paid subscriptions of, of Gemini Advance uh, and ChatGPT4 Omni. And that's a personal choice. My thinking being that I think ChatGPT is very much becoming like Hoover where it will be the sort of the, the standard name that will refer to generative AI tools. It's where our students will, will typically engage. Um, but then I played around with seeing if it could represent academic career progression in mathematics. So I asked it to generate images at each stage of the academic cycle, completely untrained. Can you guess what it came up with? So, this is what it came up with. Now, I gave this to my PhD student, Neve, and I said, Neve, have a look at this. What do you think's wrong with it? And she looked for about 30 seconds and she said, is it because the one at the bottom is not wearing shoes? Um, but if you need an example of the potential bias that's inbuilt into commercial tools going back, what, just six months? I could have trained that out, but that is what it produced. And you won't see anybody in there that's non-white. I think the only uh, female or non-male are in the undergraduate class in there. And I, I find that interesting. I find that interesting. And so I think, you know, when I think about this, I think often we, we, we look at generative AI and immediately think about the challenges. This idea that students are going to use these tools to cheat, which is where I think a lot of my colleagues start from. Uh, and if anyone your colleagues who were involved in teaching during lockdown, did you come across these sites like Check? Yeah, where students would upload things and answers would reappear. And I think the key point is some people have always cheated or will cheat. But that's no different with these tools. But what I think is really different are um, there are some new challenges coming through that I really would like us to start to think about. And I've got Kate kind of six messages that I'll hopefully recap at the end. But this is a piece of work by the Higher Education Policy Institute, uh, which is, is uh, very much a higher education think tank in, in the UK. It does some really quite lovely uh, work at helping shape thinking and policy um, across the sector. Uh, and earlier this year, it asked a thousand undergraduate students their views on generative AI. Uh, and I thought this just started to formulate the things that we were seeing, that the most common uses as a private tutor, helping to explain concepts. Interesting use of the word private tutor. I'm a big fan of social learning. My concern here is this moving it more to individual learning with a machine. And I'll show potential dangers with that. Uh, acceptable to use it for explaining concepts. So this idea of actually formulating our own ideas, looking things up, building our own opinions on topics, actually this reliance upon some of the definitions. And I've shown you some of the potential bias that comes through. Uh, interestingly, the recommendations, uh, the DfE is our Department for Education in the UK. The last thing any of us needs is any government department commissioning re um, reviews of assessment in universities. If we get to that point, I think we're in trouble, um, particularly within, within scientific disciplines. So let's think about how we deal with this ourselves. But I think some interesting pedagogic themes here that maybe get masked in this debate around are people using these tools to cheat. And so I really want to kind of focus on the opportunities. Um, and I'll, I'll give a kind of a few more examples of that as, as I, I move through. But I highlight these, um, these um, couple of quotes here. I was really pleased with this because the words opportunity rather than a threat appeared in The Independent, which is one of our big newspapers. I was quoted in The, uh, in the Independent when we uh, released the Russell Group principles. Uh, now, for anyone who knows the UK, so mainly aimed at Simon, I was also quoted in the Dorset Echo, the Swindon Explorer, and the Express and Star, um, but I only used the, the independent. Um, but what I was really pleased about with, was, was back in July, the Russell Group said the big 24 research intensive universities got together to come up with a set of five principles to shape how the sector or those institutions should get, engage with generative AI. 
Um, and we got common agreement incredibly quickly. Uh, and the emphasis there was not to see this as a threat, to think about what this might mean for student learning, pedagogy, skills development as well. So for kind of mathematical colleagues, that this is a piece of work that, that Neve, who's my PhD student, this is her work. Um, but one of the things that, that we've seen often in the UK are you talk to faculty members, so members of academic staff, about what are the challenges that students experience. And everyone has their own individual views, but they're not systematically captured. Uh, the second part of this work is actually to cross-reference these with the students and think about how we start to fix some of these issues in the system. Uh, so this is Neve's work. This isn't, this isn't mine. But the mathematical challenges, so this is talking to around half of the maths departments in the UK, so representing maybe 70% of all the mathematical sciences students in the UK, in those departments. Um, highlighting the challenges, so comments around how prepared students are and, and fluent with their mathematics when they start university, their ability to engage with different learning. So note things like staff almost overwhelmingly say students when they start learning at university, their learning is passive. They rely upon things to be transmitted. This isn't any reflection upon the students. This is a challenge on us to think about our pedagogies. Uh, the learner expectations, they're surprised that mathematics at university is different to school. Uh, and skills for success, things like difficulty managing learning or lack of independence. Uh, one of my colleagues, Jerry Pritchard, once spoke to students, said, you know, don't you want to be an independent learner? And, and a student said to him, yeah, I, of course I want to be independent. I want you to tell me how to do it. And my reason for including this is I think if I look at the things in red where I think generative AI could pose some challenges, i.e. students increasingly relying on these tools rather than learning the skills in proof or abstraction, or forcing them to be more strategic, I think they're massively outweighed by the positive opportunities. And so I'm really kind of keen to explore um, both of those. Uh, and I think a big part of my work, the, the seminar that I gave uh, when I was here, the reason for putting up the title was I was talking about mathematics support, which is something that I've been involved in in the UK for, for over sort of 20 years. Um, and when I talk about math support, what I'm talking about here is not helping students as part of their course, but actually this, the way in which institutions set up additional opportunities outside of the course or outside of mainstream learning where students can get help with mathematics. Uh, and what we have here uh, are our math support centres, which is a common way of doing it. Spaces like this, staffed, where students can drop in from any subject and get help with their mathematical learning. They're often staffed by people like Alan, who's one of our postgrad teaching assistants from mathematics. Something about maths and can check shirts is what I'm starting to spot. Um, but these have had huge impact on student learning. There's a big study out of Ireland um, that, and that we used to estimate that maybe sort of 30 to 35,000 students in the UK could have potentially dropped out had they not engaged with this support opportunity. But that's very much this personal relationship, this working with others to help learn. Notice that what's here is huge amounts of social learning taking place. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, this is, I think, a really embedded part of, of provision practice in the UK uh, and across the world. I think there's lots of evidence that this is taking place. Uh, if you're interested, that's a review that I did with a couple of people I've collaborated with, uh, friends for, for many years, Duncan Lawson um, and, and Tony Croft. I'm happy to, to share that if you're interested. Charts a history of how this math support has evolved. But I think... The reasons why students start to engage with these opportunities have much more significant pedagogic implications. This is Julian Williams, who uh, is now Emeritus Professor at Manchester. He led a big study looking at transitioning to university um, across a range of subjects. And he was looking at whether students had a positive experience. So I'm deliberately focusing on, on kind of entry here, or whether they had a negative experience. And he found that students find lectures to be intimidating. So this idea that, that, again, in the UK, I appreciate scales may be different, 
But some of our students come from very small groups at school and we pack them into lecture theatres with maybe 300. We're talking now of building lecture theatres at 600 or 1,000. And they don't know how to learn within those. We don't teach them or train them. We talk about informal peer learning, about the development of informal uh, support groups. But I talk to some of our mathematicians and I see students in year one at the end of their first year saying, I don't know anybody else on my course. I've got no friends on my course. And what's also coming out of Neve's work, and um, this is an emerging finding from the student analysis, is that we believe that those students who fail to establish peer groups, friendship groups, support groups, whatever it may be, early on are most at risk of dropping out or failing to achieve their full potential. So the social learning. Uh, comments about independent learning, but notice this bit about interactions with lecturers. Interactions with lecturers were fewer and less engaging than students expected. So students thought they'd come to university, interact with professors, as they tend to call them, but found that that wasn't happening. And that led to a negative view. And that's interesting when you think about the scales on which we're having to start to work and teach. So students use math support. Um, and this was a piece of work I did. This was, a, this was a student project. This was Sophie's student project, where we actually tried to understand why do so many well-qualified mathematics students go to the Maths Help Centre, which is set up to help people learn maths when they start in year one. Why do so many third and fourth year students go to this centre that the value they place on dialogue? They were going there because they didn't feel they had the opportunities as part of their course. And that I find really quite interesting. So why is any of that relevant in, in a generative AI context? Well, this is uh, our institutional survey. So uh, we have something called the GIST Digital Survey. We decided to embed some questions around generative AI within that. Uh, and we asked, were students using generative AI? And if so, what were they doing with it? Uh, about 5,000 responded, about a third said they were using these tools in some way. So less than the happy piece, but this is expected because it was an institutional survey. Um, this, this was manually coded. In an ideal world, I'd have got permission to run this through a generative AI tool that would <laughs> for me, uh, but that was blindingly obvious after the fact. But I did this manually. Um, and so percentages, don't worry too much about those but note the themes that are coming through. Students are using it for help with answering questions or planning. And the free text comments say things like, I couldn't contact the member of staff or they didn't reply, so I used these tools to get some assistance. Uh, asking questions about the course content, simplifying notes, so actually taking our lecture notes and writing sets of revision notes, but note the number that are using it to further understand course material. So this is kind of a, you know, an immediate reference tool. And I guess in these slides, I've probably not said anything that's unfamiliar to anyone here. But I think it's what this means for what we then do in terms of our pedagogy. Has anyone seen this picture before? It's actually a screenshot of a video. Where is it? Have you spotted where it's from, Warren? So this is the launch video uh, that was on for... Uh, chat GPT for Omni. Can anyone guess what's happening here? It's homework. What sort of homework? We've got a triangle that's got a right angle. Ge geology. <laughs> geology. Yeah. Chemistry. What? <laughs> this is uh, a student and uh, I think a parent in this context using Chat GPT four to learn trigonometry. Now, anyone, who, I'll show you my views of these tools with mathematics. I'm sure some colleagues here have, have done this as well. But isn't it interesting that the marketing language that's being used is one, mathematics, where these tools perhaps have struggled, but two, this idea that they're set up to be personal tutors. And I think we can see the direction that these tools are going to go in. The idea that you pay $20 a month or whatever it might be, and you've got a personal tutor whenever you need it. That looks to me to be the business model. So uh, what's my experience 
of using um, generative AI tools. Um, anyone remember this film? Uh, the AI equivalent with me starring in the poster is there. Um, but it's pretty much good, bad, and ugly. Uh, and I've got some conclusions that I'll, I'll lay on this, but uh, if you uh, do tell me if you've seen some of these before, but what I've been doing uh, over the last 18 months, piece of work with a colleague called Joe Kyle, uh, we spent our time playing around with the various tools, seeing how they respond to mathematics, and importantly, seeing how the responses change. Um, so here's one for the mathematicians. So we take 200 fair coins, uh, throw them up in the air, and we want to get precisely 100 heads and 100 uh, tails. Do we think that's very likely? Not very likely? More likely than anything else. More likely than anything else. Let's see. That's, that's a sitting on the fence answer. Uh, let's see what generative AI said. So this was GPT-4 uh, back in September 2023. Um, the final probability will be an exceedingly small number, certainly greater than 8 times 10 to the minus 61. I'll stand corrected on this, but if you take a factor of the order 10 million, that's probably the same as picking an atom at random out of the galaxy. I reckon it's got to be more likely than that. In the next interaction, let's be more precise, we end up with 10 to the minus 31. So we clear 30 orders of magnitude in the blink of an eye. So back in September, when we were trying these things and they came out, we were laughing at these. At how bad? If you're interested, it's about 1 in 20 is what it reduces to, about 1 in 20. Um, so, so certainly not completely unlikely, it's just a binomial uh, problem. Um, so that's kind of the bad. This I did. So this, um, I stole this from, from a colleague, Chris Sangrid, who's at Edinburgh. Um, he collects lots of really old books uh, that you won't find online with loads of problems in them. So this is kind of a classic problem that you might have seen from, from a book, say, 50, 60 years ago. It's a geometric progression. And what he did was he gave this to a bunch of new lecturers because he was talking about problems and problem solving and asked them to do it. So do you know what I did? Oh, I was not on my own. Sat with a colleague. We decided to drop it into Gemini Advance. Here are the prompts. Literally just paste that in. Let's break it down step by step. That's the next screen. It steps the whole problem into a way that I'd really love to see an undergraduate think and present. And it comes up with 469, which I think is right. Feel free to ask any further questions. You can plug it back in. I then say, prove it to me. Don't like some of the notations with the uh, asterisk for the, uh, the multiplication, but hey, I can see what it's doing. That's me being, being pedantic. But it checks each of the conditions in turn. This is almost no prompting whatsoever. But I then ran it through GPT-4 Omni. Same thing, same prompts. Look at what occurred. Uh, it's, one, it's, it's not 124, it's 139. No, it's 531. No, it's not 531. I think we're back to 124. I don't know what on earth is going on there. And the challenge is you're a student, not understanding some of these concepts. Which do you take? I like to think I've at least got the skills to be able to appraise that for myself. The other point that I think this shows is I run both paid for versions. I could afford to do that, but our students can't. Neither should they be expected. And I think what we'll start to see some of the best tools will be the ones that you pay for. Now, my caveat here is I'm going freely available tools. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm going tools that are commercially available. I think the interesting thing where we go as institutions and the work you're doing here is about the institutionally bespoke tools. And I think that's our next trajectory within Birmingham. But I then picked um, a first year exam question. So this is uh, the kind of question that we would give at the end of our first year real analysis uh, paper. 
what have we got here? We've essentially got some sort of mixing problem. We've got something uh, flowing into a tank, something flowing out. We've got a rate equation. We're going to end up with some ordinary differential equation that we'll have to solve, right? That's not the interesting bit. The interesting bit here is building the equations that describe the model, which I thought it would struggle with. So this is a challenge question on an exam paper. Imagine this were open book. This is chat GPT-4 Omni, sets it up, gets my initial conditions and my boundary conditions absolutely spot on, and then comes up with a differential equation. The next step, it drops out the solution to it. I don't even need any skill in prompting. It just does this. I then wanted to see, could I use it to create mathematical models? So I teach a year one modeling course, and I'll give you some exa an example of, of what I've tried to do um, within my own course of using these tools and encouraging students to use them. But can it create and analyze a model? So what I did was I decided to give it just a data set that I found online about Scottish hill races. So this is the idea that in the UK, some people find it fun to run up and down big hills and make it increasingly difficult for themselves to do. And the question was, which of those hill races is the most challenging? Okay. Which is, I think, an interesting problem to define mathematically. People may not see that as mathematics, but it's a problem that involves the use of mathematics. So I had a data set. I gave it a data set and said, can you build me a model? You see the Python script that it generated. It then wrote me a report. It dropped a set of references in here. Don't let anyone tell you these tools don't have a sense of humor. Uh, so remember, this is hill races. The reference, N Hill, A Scott, R Walker. They're all fabricated. But in terms of the model that it came up with, the methodology, pretty reasonable for a first, first pass. I'll put this one in. Has anyone seen the thing that happened online? So I'm not going to rerun uh, the, this was ChatGPT4, I think this happened with. I'm not going to rerun that analysis, but what I wanted to do was see what would happen if I tried it with Gemini, okay? Uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to flick over some slides, but I, I put them all in just to, or some of them, to show you the sense of scale of interaction. So the idea was that this, this uh, um, somebody asked ChatGPT4 how many R's were in strawberry, and it said there were two, okay? Uh, so I asked Gemini how many R's are in strawberry. It said there are three. I then said, are you sure? It said, yep, yeah, I'm absolutely sure. I then said, I thought there were two. You're right. I apologize for the mistake. There are only two. And it, I believe that the API with Gemini is, all, is it, the way it configured a standard. Uh, this is what my computer science colleagues tell me, is it defers to the user as to having the knowledge base. So it tells me there are two. I then say, are you sure? Yes, I'm absolutely sure. I then go through a whole process where I try to convince it it's wrong. And it spends its time telling me, at this point, I broke it. It started to refer to me as the user. <laughs> right? So clearly, when these tools rise up, they're coming looking for me after this. <laughs> but we went through that this was probably an hour. Notice it then said it was unable to assist the user. I tried to convince it. You can see what I'm trying to do to get it back. In the end, after about an hour and a half, I got it to say, you're absolutely correct. I apologize. There are three R's. It's true. You're, good. you're a good teacher. I'm a good teacher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do find it quite troubling, some of the interactions that you can have with these things when you actually find yourself flirting with them. Um, but guess what I did after it came and said there were three? I then said, are you sure? Um, but what is my point? What's my point around here? That I think it's summarized in this, this quote. This is a year old. This is from Lord Justice Burse. Um, and this is really interesting because this was, uh, he was a lawyer, uh, sorry, a, a judge, writing a closing statement and needed to put something in about a piece of, um, of case law. 
And what he did was he went to ChatGPT and it wrote it for him. And it made Sky News. And I think Sky News contacted the Bar Council for, for comment on this. The bit I hadn't realised is Sky News published this piece and there's a bit here saying audio created using AI systems. Um, the way it's written, it looks like the mistake was admitting. It, it, yeah, exactly. Um, but what he said, he was quite upfront about it. He said, I knew what I wanted to put in, and that was exactly what I was going to write, but I did it, uh, and I used it. Then you get the most British phrase ever. It's there, and it's jolly useful. But it's this point that these tools are brilliant if you know what you're doing. And the question is, how do you know what you're doing? And how do you get to that point of knowing what you're doing? I've shown that sometimes they're wrong, sometimes they're right, and sometimes you're right, but you confuse the tools. And it's a bit of a minefield. So um, did anyone see this study out of the, the, the UK? This was, I think, at Reddit, that what they did around the summer exams last year, I think it was in psychology, that they merged into the marking of some board staff member about 100 uh, AI written assessments, or 30 across each year, and didn't tell them they were AI generated. Uh, and they marked them as if they were real. What they found was that the AI generated assessments, one, 94% were not spotted as being AI generated. And that on average, it was half a grade higher. Now, they were, that was done by somebody who knew how to, uh, you know, knew the discipline. So I decided to see if I could pass year one dentistry, right? Which is so absurd. Um, the thought of me kind of being around people is, is absurd. Um, but let's pick something I know absolutely nothing about and see if I can train a model to help me pass some of the assignments in year one dentistry. With the measure being as peer marked by my colleagues without knowing. And I did it at kind of a workshop like this. So not quite as scientific, but still quite, I thought, quite interesting. So here was one of the tasks, a mini essay. I don't even know what these words mean, to be honest. But I took Gemini. I spent an hour during the T20 Cricket World Cup training it on various papers, resources. And then I used it to answer this assessment. And that's what it produced. And I gave that to colleagues and they said, this is pretty much a mid to one. I still don't know what any of those words mean. But what was really interesting, they passed it, but they put very specific requirements on the assessment that it had to be a hand-drawn image. Couldn't get it to hand-draw. It also had to be Vancouver style referenced. And um, these references are really interesting. You look at them in the subject and you say, yeah, those are people who are working in this field. You look at the journals, they're the right journal, but the rest is just made up. And this was, as I say, with Gemini, but they passed it. And they said it was a passing grade. A subject I knew and still know absolutely nothing about. So there you go. Let's see if I can pass year one, uh, year one dentistry. Challenge, challenge accepted. Um, so there's me in, uh, in a few years. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's going to run through. That, that's kind of, okay, yeah, that's the quirk. I mean, that's probably the only reason you'll be able to tell it to me, right? Or how I think I am. So this is what I've been doing over the course of the sort of the last year is trying to get my students to use this in mathematics. So we as an institution have this principle that every student every year should have opportunities to engage with these tools in the right way to learn about them, to understand what the appropriate use is. Uh, and Brett and I were kind of talking about, you know, some of the problems I give students. These were the four that I gave last year. You might look at those and think there's not an epsilon or a delta in a single location. I teach a modeling course where what I want students to do is to take a real world situation and use mathematics to understand it. So things like pastry cutting uh, problem, I've got colleagues who've done lots of work in the food industry. That's just geometric circle cracking, dressed up in another way. Uh, sustainable harvest, uh, logistic models of plant growth, but using data, data sets from the 50s. All of these have a mathematical element, but they're dressed in a certain way. Why? To try and ensure that generative AI just cannot drop out, set solutions. 
So not only did I say to students they could use it, I tried to incentivize it and encourage it. I've done more of that this year. But I tried to mitigate its influence. Group-based activities to try and, again, encourage that social learning that I want to happen. I don't want a student just to be able to be reliant on a machine because it was interesting to me that students were taking what dropped out of the AI tools as fact and not challenging it. Variety of assessment methods. Uh, we use things like videos, peer reviews, uh, oral assessment, written component. There's a peer assessment component in there. All of these problems have so many different paths that you can take. Uh, I modify them so they're context specific. Uh, this one here, try uploading a spreadsheet data set taken from government that's 100 megabytes into chat GPT and asking it to analyze it. It can't. And it's a classic Feynman problem where you give some distracting information that might be of interest, but there's one key piece in there you want students to find. Is that unfair? That's a real skill. So I'm teaching skills. Uh, and then things like reflective diaries. But the big thing that I've done is recalibrate some of our grading schemes. Because a colleague said to me, wasn't I worried that students were going to cheat? That was a comment I got. Well, aren't you worried that they're just going to cheat and use these tools? Has anyone seen this piece of work? It came out of Brown um, in uh, about a year ago. And I think it was computer science. Uh, and what they did was they had a, a coding course where not only did they ask students to use generative AI tools, they incentivized it and made available financial credit to allow students to buy some tools. Uh, I think it was $2,000 was available. Do you know how much the students actually spent? It's less than $2. Because which of these plots do you think represents the use of generative AI on the module? It's C. That there was this initial spike and then it dropped off. That's not the interesting bit. What's the, what's the interesting bit? There were three reasons as to why students didn't use it. One, they felt that it wasn't as useful as uh, might be uh, expected. Secondly, they thought they would get in trouble for using these tools despite being encouraged to do so. The third reason is the one that I really think we should think about. Uh, not ethics, but it was, if I use these tools to do the work for me, I am not going to learn. And that recognition that I'm here, I want to learn, I want to develop. And this notation that students are just going to use it to shortcut that, that process, they understood that there may well be compromises to be made. And I think that's significant. I think that's significant. Um, and this is what my students said. So I did a piece of work where I asked students after doing this. I'm repeating it this year because I think I've made much more of an effort to try and embed uh, AI into, into the module. I think we were still at the very early stages last academic year, certainly in, in, in my own institution. But you can see the quotes, things that I think are okay. I'll use it as a way to help understanding if my own work hasn't, hasn't done that. I'll use it to check answers, but I'm going to be cautious. That's landed the messages I want. Yeah, I shouldn't rely on it. I need to start thinking for myself. That's great. But then you move to, I'll use it to save time in my writing. We want students to write mathematics, not to shortcut processes. Um, focus more on mathematical analysis. Okay, shortcut some processes and give guidance. Starting to become questionable. And then, yeah, for anything that's complex or whenever I need to write scripts. But hey, only by knowing these things can I then start to think about how I use it as an instructor. Uh, and so this, I think, you know, I'm really proud of, of what we've done in, in, in Birmingham over the course of the last uh, year or so. But we've put really kind of great effort into supporting our staff members to try and develop some AI, and not just generative AI uh, literacy. I think there's a real misunderstanding of what's AI, what's generative, what's machine learning. There's a big narrative piece. But we've created a new complete study course for students. Every student is expected to engage, to have some training at the start of this academic year. And every school is going to be asked to report on what they've done. We've got new academic integrity quizzes. 
Interestingly, the feedback for that was written with generative AI, which is incredibly helpful. But we've also rolled out co-pilot for all of our students. Mm -hmm. So the thinking there being that we wanted to give students the best tools that we were able to, we cannot buy every student a single user license for chat GPT-4. But Copilot gives access to GPT-4 as an immediate model built into the Microsoft suite. I'll show you where we're, we're going to go shortly. My time. Um, but also, I think we really need to encourage colleagues to think about um, assessment. Um, and one of the things, I tried to resist this because my colleague said, yeah, can someone just write some guidance on what we need to do about our assessments? And the one thing that I hope you've, see, well, you've seen, and again, colleagues here will know this, that these tools are not static, they move. So what you do today is not going to be what you need to do tomorrow. So this whole idea of there's a set of rules and you follow them, we actually need to equip people with the skills to understand and the ped, understand what these tools mean for the pedagogies. But I wrote this, and if you want it, you can, you can take it. Uh, and it tried to kind of actually think of three different strategies or three different ways in which we might start to think about the influence of these tools on the assessment process. But none of it is about mitigating the short-term effects on a single piece of work. It's a much broader changes to assessment design. Um, and I think that's significant because that's a narrative that we need to have, not separate to bigger conversations about assessment feedback, but very much embedded as part of them. And so where is my thinking at on this? That, that I sort of realised last summer that up and down the country, uh, we will have math students, engineering students, physics students sitting in an exam hall uh, trying to invert three by three matrix, right? An important skill. But do we really need to test it in a timed unseen examination? My important question here is more along the lines of why do we expect people now to do absolutely everything from scratch? Do we do things from scratch? We don't. I put this talk together. I had a variant that I'd used and I devolved. But we expect students to do that. What if we can actually use these tools as checking whether students understand? And I tried this with getting them, um, uh, it was perplexity to write an exam question around Fermat's theorem. And it did a reasonable job. It wrote a set of solutions which looked plausible until you realized there were some subtleties that were missing. And when I gave it to students, what I realized was that the ones who'd spotted what was missing were the ones who were at the higher end. But then the conversations happened about what that meant for everybody else. And this turned into a social learning experiment which I would not have thought of had I not used an AI written answer. So these are two sets of outputs. I mean, ChatGPT drops this thing out beautifully. Gemini at the time didn't do very well. But another reason I think students turn towards these tools, notice how the accessibility features are built in at source, that you can have the spoken, spoken word. But ChatGPT drops out the perfect inverse matrix, also picks up on the idea that if a student multiplies the original by their inverted, they should end up by the M by M um, uh, identity matrix, is the key idea I wanted to get. So again, these tools can render some of that useless. And this is a conjecture. It is a conjecture. You'll have seen Bloom's taxonomy. I actually wonder, can we flip it? How much time do we spend on the idea that students spend loads of time remembering facts and understanding. I don't think this is right. It's not lost on me that an inverted pyramid is not stable. But my point here is, are we spending the right proportion of times at the right level of what I think is a very helpful taxonomy? Where do I want a Birmingham graduate to be? I want them to be at the top end of this. And I don't know whether we, have, we give them enough chance to do that as part of their programmes. And that's a conjecture and a discussion that, that I really want to have. I think in mathematics, there is some foundational knowledge. But do we need to assess it in the same ways that we have previously? What I'm trying to do is not come to a conclusion, but actually open a dialogue that is helpful to have. 
Um, and if you haven't seen this, Mike Sharples, uh, we had as our, our keynote, actually used to be at Birmingham for many years. He started to think about uh, how these tools can be used in the pedagogy and practice of, of higher education. And he's got, he kind of took some of his very early work and thought, how can I adapt this? So this idea of students are going to use these tools in isolation are the ways in which we can have pedagogically uh, robust uh, methods. And I'm just going to give you two examples and then I'll end it and, 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 and take questions. Because a few things that I've been trying, that one of the things that we make great effort for within Mathematics at Birmingham is to try and make sure all of our lecture notes and materials are available in multi-accessible formats. Anyone who does anything with, with mathematics will know that can be traditionally quite challenging. But one thing that we have a lot of are diagrams. So diagrams for screen readers, what should we include? We should include uh, short text descriptions. So I wanted to see whether actually these tools could write those descriptions for us. Um, so I picked something random to start with. Credit for anyone who knows who that is. But I fed it an image that I knew it hadn't been trained on. I said, can you generate a description? And look what it came out with. Ignore the fact that it's actually a 1960s strap. Um, that's pretty good. I then played around and created a few more images. But then I wanted to see, what's this image? It's caffeine. Pretty reasonable description. Just from an image that's been uploaded to chat GPT-4. But then a colleague, Duncan Lawson, who I did a lot of the math support work, said, I'm editing a journal, and we're, we need to have these descriptions. Do you think these tools can generate the, the captions or the, the alternative text for some of our figures? So I fed it this, which he sent me. Um, and this was a kind of a math said piece. I can't remember what it was about. But it had a series of graphs that you imagine trying to explain that to someone who's visually impaired relying on a screen reader. Where would you start? So this is what it came up with initially. But then second time, look at this. This is not perfect, but I can edit this. And so interestingly, I think, can we use these tools to actually enhance the student experience? My final example is Socratic Dialogue. I haven't got this right. I haven't quite got this right. But this is playing with the commercial tools. My experience is you train them to be Socratic, it works for about five minutes, and then they go back into the telling mode. And that's why I'm interested in the kind of bespoke tools that you deploy across an institution. But anyone who's worked in math support, has anyone heard this sort of thing before? My professor said I need to do some stats on the data that I've collected for my project. I'm lost and don't know what to do. That's the kind of email that we've all had at some point in our careers. Here's the interaction with Gemini. Yep, I can help you. So this bit here starts to be Socratic. What kind of data have you got? What do you want to find out? It moves away from it. I've not managed to crack this on the free versions just yet, but I think with some custom deployment, um, and I know other people have done this. I've collected some data. That's great. You've got paired data. Notice it just goes into telling me but I can see why students turn to these tools. And this is pretty good. I need to talk to my professor tomorrow, and he has asked, as we've seen, all professors are male, that I come back with the name of the test and what I will do. It gives me some examples going through. I'm asking it questions, it's purely telling me, so it's didactic, not Socratic. But if I can train that out, I can actually have some really positive interactions. As long as students recognize they need to challenge everything that it says, just as they should challenge what I say as an instructor. These tools are no different to people, and we should treat them in a similar way. I'm not saying that they think or are people. What I'm saying is the interactions that we have, it's another party in that learning relationship with the students, the instructor. We now have generative AI tools. And you can see these interactions as you go through. So, and that, if you think about it, takes us full circle, because where did these tools come about? The work of jo um, Joseph Weizenbaum was to mimic doctor-patient interactions with Eliza. 
I first came across Eliza uh, through young Sheldon in uh, 2018, where I think he tried to use it to save his parents' marriage. That's an example. But my final couple of slides, and then hopefully there's, there's, I've left a bit of time for questions. I'm aware colleagues in the room might think that time has stood still. Um, but I wrote something recently for our newsletter of 10 top tips for dealing with generative AI. Don't expect you to read these, but the thing that I was most pleased about was everything that came out with things that we'd done in Birmingham over the last year. So things that we put in place for students and our colleagues. And I think that you know, there's a lot of people that deserve some immense credit um, for being able to do that. Because a year ago, I don't think we were in the position to be even having this conversation. What I'm most interested in, and I know colleagues here are, are way ahead of us in that space, but when I go back, we're actually now looking at the next step, which is how we take forward bespoke customized models, not just Copilot, but using the full open AI um, Llama, you know, the full development suite, noting that this will be a project that we run with IT services. And so I think, again, this partnership approach happening across the institution. What we're worried about is people will go off and do their own thing with some of the challenges coming through. So can we actually think about what, how we might use these tools in pedagogy, but more importantly, what frameworks do we need to put in place to protect our students and staff? And we've just recently allowed the, their use in marking and grading under a set of um, principles. So those are my key messages. Hopefully they came through. I don't think we're going to outrun or outwit this thing. The narrative about keep putting up walls to stop its use, it's just never going to happen, so why fight it? We need to ethically introduce it. We shouldn't assume all students are going to cheat. I think that's a narrative we need to challenge. It's got limitations. I can tell students it's got limitations, but they don't believe me until they see it. So it's got to be hands-on and interactive. But we need to think about what we're assessing and why. This age-old debate has been going on for years, and maybe generative AI is the disruptor to change that. Thinking about the pedagogies that then support student learning, but let's not lose sight of this point, that if we're producing custom models that we release that students can lose, can use, do we want learning to be an isolated individual experience of an individual student and a chatbot? I don't think we do. What's the benefit of a Birmingham of a UBC education? It's that ability to be here with like-minded individuals to have conversations, to be part of community. I think this is a big challenge that worries me that some people may become more isolated. And I will leave it there. I'm actually ditching that picture because I much prefer that one. <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't bad, actually. I'm not playing. Yeah, I'm a bit early. Six. That's fantastic. We have oh, place, three minutes for questions if people want to ask any questions. Yeah, good work. Question. Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, thanks. Great to see to see this, uh, I guess, update on what you do. Um, I uh, don't try to be overly skeptical about it, but I'm, I'm a little curious, and this is maybe unfair to pick on your later algebra example, so you have the, the inverse of the matrix. So I'm curious if you could comment on, like, uh, people have been talking about, oh, we want more computation math curriculum for a number of years, and there have been tools available, and you could, you could argue that, well, MATLAB's tricky because you have to teach students yeah. to code to be able to actually use whatever. But we've had like Wolfram Alpha for over 10 years now. We've got some nice natural language ability, uh, and it could do kind of the stuff we showed there. Uh, my impression, I haven't studied up on this, but that its impact on mathematics instruction has been pretty minimal. Um, so could you have, like, is, is there something new here? Uh, obviously, it's handling a much broader class of problems, but... Could you, could you maybe offer no, a, 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 I think it's a really great point, Warren, that, that you know, so Wolfram Alpha has been around, as you say, 15 years. I think people were worried that it would just automate calculations that, that students wanted to do. I think the big difference with Wolfram Alpha, it's not as integrated into every part of your everyday life that these tools are. So, you know, anyone running an iPhone 16 in a couple of months will have Apple intelligence just at their fingertips. You know, it's almost, I think, these tools will just become everywhere that they will be quite routine in a way that perhaps Wolfram 
hasn't or, or won't. And I think it's interesting talking to math students, they're very skeptical of, of using these tools. And I think there are some interesting disciplinary differences coming through our, our data. But of, of the disciplines where students start to use them, mathematics and statistics are ones that, that are represented. So I think you're right. That, that I think, will these things kind of catch on? I think students have tried it once, found it's not very useful, not gone back to it. I think this is something that because it will become everywhere and a part of everyday life and things that people will do, I think it will then become the kind of the go-to. And I think what students will do in particular is rather than Google a problem, i.e. type something in and see if you can find it, they'll drop it straight into AI. And so I think it will, these things will become more of a sort of intelligent search engines that present more tailored findings. So they will become much more mainstream than my theory. Any other questions? Yeah, Matt. The coordinate our big first year calculus course. Um, we've been having an issue lately of like what is the, or how to communicate and curate with students about what the learning objectives for our books are. So they're very quick to go look at the videos. And that's great if they use a resource help for that. If you know, they say, oh, I like these videos, I like these videos. And this, when we dig deeper, they like it because the examples are easier. Yeah. And the videos that they're using will get them kind of to a C level. And they say, oh, I don't like the material provided by the class and the learning objectives of the class because they're more challenging. And so we're having to sort of have these conversations about, yes, if you find it useful, that's great. But you do need to be here. We do have learning objectives. So sort of I get people saying, can I make some videos for the course? So it's like, no, you can't just make videos and declare it associated with the course. It needs to be targeted to our learning objectives and our sort of goals and desires and maybe species. And so you're just talking about sort of using this kind of like Google. Do you have any thoughts on what we should do about this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really great question. And I think it goes back to some comments about the rote learning that Neve pulled from her work, that this idea that students rely on something that's quite formulaic, it's quite passive, so they look for, for very similar examples. Um, but what I, I think we need to do is it, it's a much bigger narrative about with students about what learning is and what are our expectations. And I think if you kind of, you know, sometimes pointing out to students, say, yeah, you can use that material, but you do know it's only going to take you to this point on the scale, which is going to be a great C. Do you want a great C? If you want a great C, great. That's where your benchmark is. But where do you want to be? And if I think it's having that sort of narrative and getting students to understand. Also, I think it's about that kind of scaffolding that we sort of put through and, and support them in the process. Because, you know, for a discipline like mathematics, I think it's joy and frustration in equal, equal measures. But students don't always get to see that. And so I, I think, you know, one thing that I started to do with my module is I bring back students in later years. So the students, they don't like it. They don't like the group work. I will get my midterm questionnaire back next week where the questions will say, what could the lecturer do to make this course better, give easier problems? And I said to them, it's like, if you write that, that means I am doing absolutely the right thing because I'm giving you proper problems that challenge you by, by learning. And then I bring kind of other students back to say, actually, no, these things take time to do. And I think that there's much more about sometimes the, the human narrative around learning that, you know, I'm not proposing we change things into a pedagogic lecture, but actually that just that realization that things take time, learning takes time, students kind of understanding the expectations and perhaps why we're doing certain things in some ways, which it sounds like you're doing. Because that's why I think it works in math support, because it gives us that opportunity to have that one-to-one -one dialogue and students understand the challenge that we've got is doing that at scale. And I think that's that bit of thinking about our, our pedagogies. It's a really great question. It's a really great question. Well, I, did you have any further? I, I would, I'm looking forward to chatting with you later. I also was really excited to hear about your work and policy around I So hopefully we'll, uh, yeah, no, we'll have more chances to chat, but join me in thanking Michael. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to invite here, and I think I, I will thank Barbara again for um, the superb effort that, that's been made to try and organise this whole thing, which I know is not easy when you get a visitor dropped on you. It's been 
Expertly done. Expertly done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, was a, it was a joint effort. It's lovely to have you here. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's genuinely a real pleasure to be here. Yeah. And thanks to those joining online. Um, yeah, thank you for joining us.